Hey guys, welcome to today's video. Today I want to share with you my key takeaways from Michael Brower's long video series that he recently published on puremix.com. Before we get started, let me say that I have tremendous respect for Michael Brower and what he accomplished with his Browerize mixing method. I can only dream about the kind of career that he has and I learned a tremendous amount from studying his work over the last few years. So if I say anything critical about his method, then it should be viewed and understood through this lens, mostly because many things he does will simply not be possible for us, for reasons I will share in this video. Let's do it. So first, let's do a quick overview about the Browerize method. I don't want to go too much in depth here as it has been documented and talked about in huge detail in many, many videos, interviews and articles. But for those who don't know, the method of his mixing is to use multiple master buses that have different characters so he can build a feel and a sonic identity for the song. These five sub-masters then go into one stereo bus where another master bus chain glues everything together. If this sounds complex, then it's probably because it is. There are many, many pitfalls, but also huge advantages to working like this, and I want to cover some of these in detail. So in no particular order, let's start with number one. Brower talked in a series a lot about the tone of different compressors and how he achieves a sound signature through a blend of using different compressors that bring out different sonics in different instruments. This again sounds very complex. What he says can be extremely misleading to beginners, however, so I would like to add a few nuanced things here. When he talks about the tone of a compressor, he means a sonic difference that will be almost completely unnoticeable to the untrained ear, not to mention to the average listeners with their earbuds and horribly compressed audio files on smartphones or mp3 players, whatever. So while I definitely agree that different compressors have a different tone, and I use different compressors because of their tone as well, I must say here that if significant tonal change is required, then reaching for an EQ should be still the first choice. No compressor will fix a muddy vocal no matter how sparkling it is, and no compressor will tame a harsh electric guitar no matter matter how warm it is. It is important to listen to what he says in the context of the quality of productions he receives, which are probably excellent most of the time, but more on this later. Number two, the bounce and feel aspect is what is most important with his method, as he himself says repeatedly as well. The pulsating, slightly pumping feel he achieved with his method in the video series made a huge difference to how a listener moves to the song, and I think this is the most relevant part. This is something we have to be able to do as mixers, regardless of the method. Number three, one more very important thing we have to mention is that he has two assistants to do mix prepping and level matching for his work, which means he can attack every song with fresh ears and with a very good starting point. This won't be possible for most of us, as we will most likely have to prep our mixes ourselves, and through this process we will be more familiar with it when we start mixing it already. Personally I like this because I know where the individual elements are in the mix as I work, and because I can hear and often see issues before I even start mixing. That said, I'd love to be able to start from such an advanced point as well, and I think mixing would become much faster and much easier. The next point is that the gain staging process for his mixing setup is very meticulous. His assistant will not only prep the mixes, but make sure that every fader on the digital board will be in the ideal zone with the right amount of gain on them, so they work as intended. As we know, Brower goes through a very detailed calibration process for his mix template, and the whole method relies heavily on tracks being in a certain gain range when he mixes. The next important point is that despite the image he wants to create with his multibus setup, he does use the SSL4000E and 9000J channel strips on the individual tracks for further EQ and compression if required. This was the most important piece of information to me as I was watching the video, because throughout the whole series I was left wondering whether he actually uses any EQ at all on individual tracks. It is one thing that the buses have some EQ on them, but those are more for tone shaping than fixing potential series issues. What was very surprising to me was that all of his tracks came pre-labeled and preset with EQs as well. He showed us his piano setup as an example, but I'm left wondering whether it is this exact setup up all the time, or if he changes it song per song. He talks a lot about how there are no rules, but at the same time he seems to have very precise presets already set up. 
The next point is that his vocal chain is pretty crazy. Using one TLA audio compressor in series and then four parallel chains is quite intense to start with. Here I want to mention for the more novice mixers again that they shouldn't expect the huge tonal changes that he talks about when using such a convoluted parallel setup. If your vocal is lacking clarity or body, then an EQ should be the first choice and then only followed by whatever kind of compression method that suits the song. Parallel compression on vocals is is great of course and I use a combination of serial and parallel compression many times as well. Brower mentions that he will use very little compression on most of his compressors apart from the Distressor and the 1176 but at the same time we have to remember that the tracks most likely arrive pretty compressed to him already. The song they play in the video series for instance has plenty of compression in the vocals and they sound quite flattened out to start with. Not to mention that the vocal already had huge amounts of EQ on it as well and was pretty much finished sounding already. So when he receives it and then applies even more compression, whether in series or in parallel, and then EQing as well, it's a completely different game to what most of us are playing when we receive completely raw tracks. The next important revelation came in chapter 8, where he showed exactly how his buses affect the mix. As a novice listener, you would be forgiven if you didn't hear any difference for the first time, and I'm sure many of you were expecting a much more significant tonal change, including myself as well, to be honest. The difference was very nuanced, and to my ears the change in tonality was very minor, but the change in feel indeed was quite significant. This shows that significant tonal changes will have to come from EQ if desired, and bussing and compression alone will not be able to achieve that. However, I found it quite amazing how he achieved this change in feel just by running these faders into the compression. That's pretty cool, I think. The next thing this video series also taught me is how little some professional mixers do and how much effort often goes into creating very little sonic change but a huge difference in feel. Brower is a very good example for this and other mixers like Chris Lord LG will often have a much more aggressive approach where the finished mix will often sound quite different from the rough. The next interesting point was how he mixes into the master bus quite aggressively, only leaving his mastering engineer a couple of dB headroom. This is quite normal and I have seen and heard unmastered mixes from some very prominent mix engineers that were completely brick walled, leaving absolutely nothing for the mastering engineer to work with. As a matter of fact, I sat into a mastering session once in Ebriot Studios for an album where I mixed a couple of songs on and I saw the desperation on the mastering engineer's face when these extremely brick walled mixes mixes came up. There was basically nothing he could do at this point because the dynamics were already completely flattened so he just used a couple of notch EQs to remove a bit of harshness and a bit of mud and that was basically it. At the same time having experienced this and having tried many different mastering engineers myself I can tell that more often than not the difference between mix and master will be quite small in terms of tone. The level might come up a bit, the dynamics might be more managed but once level matched with the mix there is often very little difference between mix and master and many times less difference than I was actually hoping for. This also shows again how much respect mixers and mastering engineers show to the efforts of the people before them in the chain and how much they try to preserve their sound. For producers this is bad news of course because this means that they will still have to work very hard on making excellent sounding productions so they can be mixed to perfection. And for the mixer this also means that we have to work harder as we can't expect the mastering engineer to polish up our turd. The next point we have to keep in mind is that these top level mixers receive productions of top notch quality and with clear intentions and often a lot of processing already having been done to the tracks. With intention I mean that it is clear from the very beginning what feel and sound the artist is after and what the roles of the individual tracks are in creating this feel. If this factor is present then it becomes very easy to mix a song. So they most often already start at a high level and have to work on taking it only one or two steps further. I experienced this during my time with Yuad Nivo as well. Many of the songs he received already sounded pretty finished and he just worked on enhancing the feel and the sonic identity. I would be very very curious to see what Brower, CLA, Maserati, Sheps and the others would do with more raw productions where the quality of the tracks is maybe not as good and the intentions of the artist not as clear to what they're used to. The next important point that I want to make is 
don't run out and buy all the plugins that he uses after watching his video. We have to remember that we are part of an industry and they very much expect for engineers and musicians watching these videos to get emotionally hyped up and go out buying compressors and EQs that they don't really need. And this is a big trap for beginners of course. I myself went out and bought many many plugins in the past that I didn't need after watching some videos. Instead, I would encourage you to look closer at the concepts he describes and maybe come up with alternative ways to achieving similar results. If you're serious about music, mixing and production, then you should of course have a solid selection of tools available. But if you're just starting out, then I'd recommend to experiment with the stock plugins first and learn how to use them. And as you learn, maybe subscribe to an all-in plan from one of the popular manufacturers. They're all great in my opinion, and they will give you all the tools you need and all the sonic qualities and identities entities you can imagine. So finally, will I change to browserizing? I already tried doing a simplified version of it a few years ago and while I had some great sounding mixes as a result, the extra complications and requirements were not worth it to me in the end. I have a solid template now that works for me and is very flexible so I'm not really locked into a place and I can try different things as I mix. I work with many genres and I can comfortably tackle all of them and sound appropriate every time. So for now I'm going to stick to it, although I did take a few tricks that I'll put in my template. The widening bus with the BX Master EQ and the width control is pretty amazing. I already tried on some guitars and I'm super excited to try it on some of my next mixes. So there are of course a lot more takeaways and I love watching these pros work and learning from them. I have taken many many tricks from many of my favorite mixers like CLA of course, Sheps, Brower, Spikestan, Pensado, Yoadnivo, Guzowski and many many more. And with this video I mostly wanted to give you an insight of what I learned from watching these videos and some of my thought processes as I do so. I think it is important to view these tutorials with a bit of objectivity and not have expectation of immediately being able to sound like your favorite engineer. In the case of Brower, his ears, monitoring and of course experience have a lot bigger impact on his work than just the Browerize method by itself. So rather than trying to copy him, I'd encourage everyone to instead take some of his tricks and implement them in your own workflow. And more importantly, try to understand the concepts behind his methods and why and how he uses them. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe and hit that notification bell as well. And feel free to message me in the comments about topics you'd like me to cover next. I'm also building my own highly in-depth mixing course as well that I think will help beginners tremendously. And I will keep you posted about that as well. I will see you in the next video and until then, happy mixing. Bye bye.